off later. And so that if this spoke to you, you can share uh, this conversation with colleagues um, and other folks in, in our large um, nursing home community around uh, the Moving Forward Coalition. I'm Isaac Longobardi. I'm the director of the Moving Forward Nursing Home Quality Coalition. I see um, my my two partners um, in this work, Sumeri Maki, our associate director, and Alice Bonner, our chair, um, on the call. Um, we are uh, really excited to be having this conversation today. Uh, we've been around for almost two years now. Um, we're funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation. We're funded to take recommendations from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine report and transform them into real tangible action in the near term. And from the earliest days, one of the uh, biggest topics uh, we've uh, had folks say we need to think about and talk about is the lived space of nursing homes, um, the, the buildings that people occupy. Um, we like to say that nursing homes are people's homes. Um, and when we think about health information technology to transparency and accountability, um, to uh, quality measurement and improvement that, that we do think about in this coalition um, of amazing experts and stakeholders and leaders, um, we cannot forget that fundamental fact that we are talking about people's homes. Um, since launching our action plans in July of 2023, uh, one of our big areas of focus, one of our action plans has been on exactly that. How can we finance and incentivize the transformation of our largely institutional um, nursing homes that 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 um, are the majority of the 15,000 nursing homes um, that 1.5 million nursing home residents live in? Um, how can we incentivize the transformation of those homes into more home-like or, you know, I've I've been told by many of my colleagues that home-like is not quite the right word because they actually are just the homes to, to the homes that we want uh, nursing home residents uh, to be able to live in. Um, we talk a lot in those discussions about household models, uh, which, which really do embody that concept of home and bring a smaller scale uh, privacy and dignity to the spaces um, that people occupy. Um, and, and we talk about other changes that may be more incremental just from private bedrooms to private bathrooms that can be steps along that road um, to those more innovative household uh, models. So um, I'm not going to go into too much of those details of what the coalition is doing around that. We have some amazing coalition members who can speak to that as we as we progress. Um, I want to let our speakers um, really talk to us about their work. Um, so we're thrilled to have with us uh, Maggie Calkins, Adi Abusheshe, and John Williams uh, today. Uh, they come to us, um, all, all together, they come to us from the Facility Guidelines Institute, um, but they have a wealth of experience beyond that as well. And so I'll briefly read um, their bios, um, and then I'm let them dive into uh, this conversation about how building codes can really drive uh, the transformation of nursing homes um, and person-centeredness in nursing homes. So uh, Addy is an, an organizational and environmental gerontologist and research associate for the Center for Health Design uh, with combined ex expertise in architecture, organizational development, gerontology, and research. Addy advances comprehensive translational quality assessment and performance improvement agendas for aging and dementia throughout the continuum of care. Addy is a tri-chair for uh, FGI's Residential Design Guidelines, advisor for the AIA Design for Aging Knowledge Community and Abacus Institute, adjunct faculty at Kent State University, a board member for Ideas Institute, and, and proudly uh, a committee member for the Moving Forward Nursing Home Quality Coalition. Maggie is, a nat is nationally recognized as a creative, dynamic leader, educator, and researcher in the field of environments for elders. She is president and board chair of Ideas, Innovative Designs and Environments for Aging Society. She has published extensively and has partnered with Pioneer Network, The Greenhouse Project, and Plain, Plain Tree um, as well. Um, and she is a committee member for the Moving Forward Nursing and Quality Coalition as well. She was a founding member of SAGE, which is the Society for the Advancement of Gerontological Environments, and is on the editorial board for the Gerontologist, Journal of Housing and, Elder, and the Elderly Journal, of Clinical Psychology and Health Environments um, Research, uh, sorry, <laughs> Journal of Clinical Psychology and Health Environments Research and Design Journal. And finally, but uh, not least at all, John Williams, 
um, has 30 years of experience with healthcare design, planning, and regulation. John is the Vice President of Content and Outreach for the Facilities Facility Guidelines Institute. He is also the Executive Director of Facilities Construction and Licensing with the Washington State Department of Health and leads the review of licensed healthcare facilities to state licensing and federal certifi certification requirements. He chaired the International Code Council's Healthcare Qu Committee for 12 years and is currently the chair of FGI's Health Guidelines Revision Committee. He also serves on various technical committees for NFPA. He is a frequent speaker on healthcare codes and standards. Um, we are so excited to have these folks here today. They wanted to keep this conversation open and dynamic. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, let us know, and we're happy to kind of dodge and dive to where your brains are at. So Addie, Maggie, John, thank you so much for being here, and take it away. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, we really approach this presentation with the premise that we are building more than buildings, that we are, in fact, moving person-centered performance standards forward. Uh, Isaac, thank you for that very thorough introduction. I think what's important to, to emphasize here that I am one of the chairs of the residential design guidelines for the Facility Guidelines Institute. Uh, I am a member of the HGRC committee, which is the Health Guidelines um, Revision Committee. I don't know, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> residential you got committee. It. <laughs> one of those, uh, and have been involved in other code activities over the years. And similar to um, both of these fine folks, uh, I, I work with FGI. I'm the vice president of content and outreach, and I'm the chair of the committee, and I've worked on a lot of code committees over the past several hundred years, it feels like. <laughs> So we just want to give the heads up that while we don't think anything that we're going to talk about is inconsistent with the views or the positions of the Facility Guidelines Institute, we do want to emphasize that some of what we're talking about today is beyond the scope of the guidelines and we're going to offer our opinions. So thank you everybody for being here. Thanks for uh, being curious about codes and standards. Uh, as Isaac mentioned, I am a regulator, so I know that makes me not the most popular person in the room. And not only am I a regulator, I get involved in code development and writing the standards. So that's kind of like being the kid in high school that raises their hand and says, hey, teacher, you forgot to give us homework. Can we have some more? But the type of work that Addie and Maggie and I do together uh, over a, a, a wide span of different code writing organizations is to bring sensibility back to the building codes, look at the types of spaces that we design around where, where people receive care, and, and try to bring logic and, and form back to how we design care spaces, how we design communities. So um, building codes uh, have been around for a long time, um, originally all the way back to Hammurabi and um, um, where, where we were really interested in buildings that didn't fall down uh, through the centuries to uh, major fires in metropolitan areas uh, where, where the span and scope of impact of the built environment really begin to adversely focus um, um, or, or, or adversely affect people. Uh, in the beginning, building codes were really around fire protection. How do we um, make sure that if a fire happens in one house, it doesn't spread to the adjacent houses and buildings associated with it? Um, and when we look back, um, especially around those, those places in this country where we design, um, um, where people receive care, um, back around the middle of last century was really when we started focusing in on healthcare facilities and residential care facilities because we wanted to incentivize the construction of them and uh, provide some pathway for reimbursement um, and support for these uh, types of facilities. And around that period of time, we had some pretty spectacular fire events that really cast a long shadow over the way we write building codes um, for, for, for many decades. And we, we still live under the shadow of a lot of those codes and standards today. But codes and standards are, are, are meant to be there to help us provide, have safe places, reasonably predictable places uh, where we can live and play and work um, and all sorts of all sorts of factors go into the development of those. From, from our perspective, uh, we're, we're looking at codes and standards that support the way that people actually live 
Um, and we know that building construction um, care modalities evolve quickly over the years. So every, every three or four years, we get into a process where we revisit the concepts that are in there and try to try to bring um, what, what can seem like a static code at some time or a set, static set of requirements into modern times and say, hey, we can use these new building techniques, these new building materials, and consider different ways of living, providing care, things like that. So they, they evolve on a regular basis and um, we're, we're here to help shepherd them through that process. Next slide, please, Addie. I would argue for today's conversation that there are three main code promulgating bodies that, that govern residential care, nursing home care. And that's the International Code Council, the National Fire Protection Association and the Facility Guidelines Institute. Arguably, we know inside of these environments, these are heavily regulated environments, and there are so many different types of codes and standards. But when you're looking at building something specifically related to the built environment, physical environment inside of facilities, these are the three main ones that we use. We reference a lot of other different standards, um, but but these are the three main bodies that, that develop the standard. Next slide. So, ICC develops the building code, fire code. Uh, these are typically what you need to get a building permit. And these cover basic fire and life safety, um, structural safety, the components about how to uh, put a building together. National Fire Protection Association or the NFPA create a wealth of codes and standards, many which evolve around those infrastructure systems like electrical systems or fire sprinkler systems, um, are that, that are components inside of the built environment. But there are a couple of key codes here, namely NFPA 101, the Life Safety Code, and NFPA 99, the Healthcare Facility Code, that are instrumental when we talk about receiving CMS certification, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services certification as a long-term care facility or an acute care facility. Um, and really, frankly, when you look at the scope there, NFPA covers healthcare, life safety, and facility systems. So there's a little bit of overlap in that life safety and basic building safety between these first two sets of codes. The FGI standards set are set apart really because they cover a different spectrum of risk. Inside of these standards, we're looking at the, the risks that are associated with functional safety, infection control, inside of those healthcare and residential care type facilities. So really quickly, if you, if you look at it, the building codes are gonna tell you how to build a pretty good building that's not likely to fall down and probably won't catch on fire usually. Uh, but if it does catch on fire, there's a really good chance that we're gonna get out of it. And in some facilities, the building itself is going to put the fire out. There's a fair bit of overlap with the with the life safety codes and, and other things, but this will tell you how to design those infrastructure systems like generators, medical gas system that support really specialized types of care. The guidelines themselves are gonna help you understand what kind of support spaces you need, what kind of ventilation systems you need um, for good infection control, how big rooms need to be, how a hand wash sink is designed, that, that type of stuff. Next slide, please. So um, focusing in on the Facility Guidelines Institute for just a minute, it is a non-for-profit organization that develops three standards, one for hospitals, one for outpatients, and one for residential type facilities. Um, these are very scalable, as you might imagine, by three different books. We recognize that we build each of these different types of facilities in a dramatically different way mainly because the risks are different. The types of function and um, the things that go on inside of these buildings are different. So beyond that, inside of each of these guidelines, they're very scalable as well. So we don't require that a, uh, a critical access hospital is built the same way as a psychiatric hospital. And we don't require that a uh, small physical therapy um, outpatient space is built the same way as a nursing home. So there's built-in scalability inside of these documents. The scalability relates to 
risk assessments and understanding of function. So as we understand um, how a space is intended to function, we try to craft the mitigations around those particular sets of risks that will show up in um, this type of space. They're intended for new work only or renovation of existing buildings. And we have a host of supporting resources to help you understand kind of what that means, not only how to implement them, but to understand some of the words and concepts there behind the code. There are multiple different additions adopted in multiple states. And Addie, if you go to the next slide, you will see a patchwork of different versions adopted in different states. And this is a map of where, where each of these versions, and by version, I mean which, which year is associated with the document. Every four years, we create a new version of the document. We're currently on the 2022 version of the document, um, but um, we, there are still states that adopt the 2018 or the 2014 or the 2006 even um, in their particular state. So um, when we look at this, um, we have to recognize as designers, enforcement folks, um, operators, that it really is specific to the state um, to understand what code is, is used in every state. So this is, this is just a patchwork of all of the documents. Only about half of these states adopt the residential care guidelines. So that residential book, the red book, is only adopted in about half of these states. Next slide, please. The guidelines uh, are put together every four years um, by a group of experts. Right now there's 137 people and it's purposeful that you can't read all of these names because we're trying to get across. It is a host of different folks. And these folks come from different backgrounds. Um, typically uh, about a third of the committee is made up by practicing clinicians inside of spaces, gerontologists, surgeons, physicians, each attached to the specific document that they would particularly support. Um, we have nurses, uh, we have infection preventionists. Another third is made up of authorities having jurisdiction like myself. So these could be federal um, regulators or local regulators and building owners. Um, so these, these are folks who manage and direct um, small systems, big systems, rural systems, urban systems, all types of different folks. And then there is a cadre of designers, whether it is uh, architects, engineers, um, acousticians, uh, all, all different types of folks. So this multidisciplinary approach, I think you see um, show up in a lot of different aspects. We, we look at every single uh, proposal from all of those, those different perspectives of how would it be to work in this space? How would it be to build this space? How would it be to regulate the space? And how would it, you know, what, what are the impacts of, you know, the codes and standards on designing this space? So a whole, whole lot of people in the same, in the, it, looking at the same code change. Um, the code development cycle follows a four-year cycle. It starts when we open up um, the document and invite anyone to make a proposal um, on the document that exists, the most current version of the document. Um, anybody can make a proposal. Um, we collect all of those proposals and all of those are looked at by the select committee. We vote on those and ultimately at the end of that, it creates a first draft of the, the next document. We put that first draft out there and again, invite anyone from the public uh, to comment on that draft. Process, the community comes back, looks at that, all of those comments and, and, and look at that all in, in, in greater context and create uh, ultimately a final draft. That goes through an editing process and uh, ultimately will create a new document. Since um, we do not have the authority to make law or rule, uh, any code and standard is just a code and standard until some authority having jurisdiction adopts it. So that will be a state, a local, or a federal agency will adopt a standard. Um, basic due process. Um, 
once it's adopted, we begin to implement it. So we start, designers start using it to inform new designs and regulators like licensing agencies will start enforcing the codes and standards. And that's really where we learn about those all those words that we wrote in, in the beginning part of this process. Seeing those interpretations, seeing how people um, engage with, with the words that are on the paper is always kind of surprising. I'm, I'm always amazed at, you know, I, I may write a particular sentence and put it out there thinking it's so completely clear that there's only one answer to this, that every, everybody could get there and see all the different interpretations that come from designers and other AHJs. It's, it's humbling. And um, what it leads to is the beginning of the next cycle where we, we invite people back into the cycle to look at things and, 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 and make it better. So there's two different things that you'll see inside of these documents. There's the minimum requirements. Um, those are typically those things that you shall do, you have to do. Um, there's also appendix text and all sorts of resource documents that are really advisory. So you, you should read the white papers and all of that appendix material and advisory material. It helps you uh, implement the documents, but it's not a minimum standard. Um, the document, this document, which had its birth uh, back in 1946 as part of the Federal Register in the development of um, um, the Hill Burton Act, which incentivized a lot of construction. I wish I could share with you the history. It's fascinating history, but we just don't have time. The document has always been scalable. It's always been risk-based and adaptive. And I think of all of the codes and standards that you look at, it's it's kind of been the poster child for this scalability and adaptability because it's always been focused on the concept of a functional program. And that's something that you as a facility writes. The functional program drives how we implement and enforce the document. So I think that's that's something unique and something really kind of beautiful about, about the FGI is we try not to paint you into corners during design. We try to create a performance-based um, set of regulations that are clear enough that, that you can pick up pick up the book and, and understand what compliance looks like, but it gives you a lot of different options to consider new evolving ways of living, being a community of, of providing care. Next slide, please. Also, um, I think it, it, it and all of the other codes acknowledge that there's a fair bit of regionality when it comes to risk. I live in Washington state, so we've got a couple of volcanoes, there's tsunamis, earthquakes, all sorts of different things. I pay a lot of attention to, to some of those mitigations where maybe somebody in Kansas wouldn't. So there's also that, that regional um, um, scalability built into the documents as well. So when we're looking at uh, those emergency conditions that come up, um, we, we understand that there's, there's a way that you can build a building to be resilient against you know, all of those potentials, uh, and it is very regional often, um, but the mitigations that are meant to be there are really worst case scenario. And as I think we'll, we'll begin to talk about the pandemic here in a few minutes, we'll realize that, um, you know, we don't want to create necessarily monuments to, to one particular event or our mistakes. So the development process um, is, is pretty simple. I, I mentioned just because we write a code and standard doesn't mean automatically that it's a law. Typically what happens, somebody um, in a legislative agency or an executive agency will have a good idea like, hey, we, we, we need to ensure quality inside of nursing homes or ambulatory surgery centers or hospitals or something like that. They will develop a bill um, that eventually becomes a law. Typically what that law will do, it will grant a, an administrative authority, and that could be a local building official um, or building jurisdiction, it could be a Department of Health or a Department of Social Services, some authority to do rulemaking. That authority will create an administrative rule that typically will adopt one of these national standards like the building code or the FGI, and they will appoint a building authority or AHJ to enforce that. All of that um, 
is to say that just because um, there's a there's a coder standard out there doesn't mean that you can automatically pick it up and start enforcing it willy nilly, right, Eddie? Absolutely. In addition to the adoption of the additions um, by state, there's also some um, some conditions that apply whenever you have new construction, the building code or guideline is going to apply to that building automatically. However, in the cases of renovations, you actually need to reach a tipping point before you're subject to the requirements of a code or guideline. And this is where I want to start to talk about the household model in particular, because you can see here we have a very traditional layout and for organizations who are landlocked, who don't have the money for new construction, don't have room for new additions, renovation can be a very promising option. And here's where Maggie and Dr. Kaup, Majet, and I start to emphasize the ability to think and get small. Rather than thinking about the building in its totality, we start to think about buildings in sections such that we could subdivide them. Frequently, the subdivision, because we are reallocating the public spaces within the building, we are potentially reconfiguring or adding private rooms and thinking about this in terms of separate functional parts. These do fall under the purview of the guidelines because of the extent that we are modifying the building. Now, it was Sir Winston Churchill who said, we shape our buildings and thereafter buildings shape us. And I think that that's especially important whenever we think about what individuals who are living within healthcare spaces are subject to. There are a number of performance standards that are established by trade organizations, technical societies, standards development groups, and government agencies that govern the way or establish the performance requirements for a building. But I also want to emphasize that there is an evidence-based design strategy that we, that Maggie and I employ extensively and that we within the guidelines lean on heavily from a functional perspective. Evidence-based design was, is a term that was coined by the Center for Health Design, whom I work for in 2009. And what we're really talking about is just a process for basing decisions about the built environment on credible research to achieve the best possible outcomes. So what we're starting with here and maybe, Maggie, I'm going to turn things over to you at this point. Okay. Thank you, Eddie. Um, so what we're talking about are how do we link what we're doing in the design to what we want to have happen as outcomes? We don't want to design buildings that cause people to trip and have falls or that cause people to, who are at risk for infection to develop more infections. And so we develop our design strategies to, and they're often hypotheses. So if we design it this way, we think it will have this kind of outcome. And so the hypothesis is what's the design? What's the influence? Is it going to increase or decrease some outcome of interest and by being very specific about that you can you can lay out in in um very specific ways how you are going to design to maximize these outcomes and so we're going to start with the outcomes and work our way back through the beginning of this so next slide um different kinds of outcomes there are organizational outcomes nursing homes are struggling with staffing issues. Are there things in the design that can make staff have higher satisfaction and less burden? Are there things that you can do that increase your census? Things like that. There are operational um, outcomes that might have to do with decreasing costs associated with getting food to the dining room, to the residents, workforce, occupants, the residents, the families, vendors, other people who use the building, all of those. Um, and, and we look at um, the outcomes at different levels. So it, 
it needs to be identifiable, not not too broad, like we want to improve quality of life. That's that's not operationally effective. Um, it needs to be measurable. And so a lot of effort has gone into designing measures that can assess these different kinds of outcomes. How you calculate your staffing patterns, your hours per patient day can vary a lot and it gives you different kinds of information. So you need a consistent way of measuring it. You want to prioritize it to focus on those outcomes that are of most interest um, and deal with the complexity because the environment and the care system and all of the people all interact in a very complex and, and messy way. And within the confines of the guidelines and the individuals who are engaged in these kinds of conversations, outcomes can frequently um, be contradictory, not just complementary. So we get the opportunity to work our way through those conversations. Can I jump in? Sorry, we have a, an interesting question in the chat, and I wonder if this is a good point to address it. Um, Cheryl writes, um, asks about um, bathrooms. And I'm wondering if kind of as you guys are think talking about your sort of how we create measurable things that changes that can be measurable, that can be operationalizable, if that's a word, um, could, could you apply that to bathrooms and sort of, you know, our, you know, the coalition wants to see more private bathrooms. Well, how, how could that, how can you take that as an example here? So, so we read Cheryl's the, mind. The, the private bathrooms issue, we, we're, we're going to talk about bathrooms a little later on, private bathrooms means that you've started with your design feature what's the outcome of interest is it enhanced sense of privacy is it safety is it you got you got you got to get all three components um so in bathrooms falls are a big issue infection control can be an issue if you have multiple people using it um and so you've got to go through the whole process and set up what what's the outcome of interest in particular um so let me come back to that because we'll talk about a section of grab bars uh, of, of bathrooms later on related to grab bars um so so when we look at the outcome and we're looking at how is the design going to influence it again particularly in the fgi guidelines we're really interested in in the, the sort of the functionality of it. Um, there are other codes that will make sure that the building is fire safe. Um, we wanna know that it supports the residents and the staff in the residential document um, to, to achieve those sort of broader goals. Um, and so there are therapeutic event objectives. Um, we want to enhance desirable outcomes of engagement and social interaction with each other. How does the environment support that? Undesirable outcomes are falls or nosocomial infections. Um, and there are different ways in which the environment can do that. Some of that is in materials. If you're using copper or silver-based materials, that can reduce the antimicrobial load that stays on fomate on surfaces. Um, so, so you've got to really look at what is the the influence, and you know these are businesses, and so we also need to look at the return on investment. Is it worth the cost of doing something different? And we particularly look at cost not just as first initial cost of the during the construction like ceiling lifts uh in bedrooms that will enable someone to be transferred on a lift system from the bed to a toilet um and it's not just what's the initial cost but what's the cost savings in terms of dollars and in terms of reduced staff injury um and therefore reduced workers compensation over time. And so we take that kind of a long-term perspective. Next slide. Um, so then we look at, we work our way back into what's the design intervention that will have the influence on the outcome that we are interested in. And we spend a lot of time talking about the differences between, you know, larger nursing homes and small six-person assisted living. 
do we want the same rules in place for those different kinds of settings? And, and how do we think about what's appropriate in a given setting and, and looking at that, that the cost uh, functions of that. Um, we deal with it at the level of site all the way down to details, finishes. It, are you using an antimicrobial paint or, or grab bar material? Um, and we look at all of the different kinds of surfaces. It could be floors, walls, ceiling, windows. It can be the HVAC system. How many air exchanges are you doing? Things like that, that can have an impact. Um, when, when Addie and I in particular and several other people um, in the uh, this revision, the guideline revision process, we look at the credibility of the information that we're getting. We don't just sit around and brainstorm and say, well, I think this. We get the experts out there and say, what's the research? If it isn't research, is there expert consensus? Um, if there is an expert consensus because this is a brand new idea, how do we evaluate it? And so we look at the source of the information. Is it peer reviewed? Is it authority, expert opinion? Um, does it does it just you know pass the sniff, te sniff test? Does it does it sound like this is right? We don't tend to rely on that very much because we don't trust our noses. Um, and and so it's a very systematic process that we use as we are evaluating the evidence to make decisions about what should be in these guidelines. Next one. Um, and particularly in the residential document, um, we take a very deep person-centered value proposition. This framework comes from work that was done quite a long time ago with the Colorado Foundation for Medical Care. Um, and they developed this framework for defining the, the core components of person-centered care of resident directed, not just resident centered, but resident directed care and, uh, and activities, a home environment, um, building on relationships, continuous measurement of what you are doing and what's the impact that it's having, collaborative and decentralized management of self-managed work teams, um, not just a top-down hierarchy and staff empowerment. Um, and so we, we really try to bring these values into the work that, that we are doing. Um, and so the code development process in, 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 at FGI, um, and I can tell you it at you know, NFPA and ICC as well, um, looks like it's a, a really messy process. And in some ways it really is a messy process, um, but our goal is to simplify all of the thousands and thousands of decisions that need to be made so that the design process can be a little smoother and we can really say to designers and engineers and the providers who that they're working with you know these are the sort of constraints that you want to work in so that hopefully delivery will be a smooth process next slide and, and i'll turn it to you within the guidelines it it actually it is a very messy process, but we have methodologies that we try to employ that help to simplify some, you know, milestones, some barricades, some borders that keep us in our swim lane. And, you know, for a lot of this, it's, it's consistent with the evidence-based design process. And Maggie mentioned the cost benefit analysis. This is something that is specific to the guidelines because of the intent to support the operations and the functional use that I think it's, is uh, distinguishing it from other, other guidelines. We also try to forecast what is coming down the pipeline. Now the pandemic was a rising tide event that I'm not sure from a guidelines perspective we could necessarily forecast, but we did try to um, learn from that and react to it with emergency conditions white papers that were released to provide guidance in those kinds of instances with some restraint. We didn't necessarily feel like in the pandemic, it was necessary to build monuments to hand washing, to different kinds of procedures that limit the infection 
um, transmission within long-term care settings because we have a recognition that these are people's homes. So restraint is also exercised within the guidelines. And then of course, looking to the sources of information and where we can have the most credibility. Mm -hmm. So just as a quick example, um, back in 2010, a group of us were getting together and talking about what would make nursing homes more like home. And the num one of the number one issues was being able to have access to a residential kitchen, which was not allowed by the codes for nursing homes. And we went to, a group of us went to NFPA, which does the life safety code. Um, and they sort of looked at this group of new people coming in and said, yeah, we talk about kitchens. And if you're really interested in this, it's going to take you about a decade to get it approved. Um, and we went through a process. And one of the, the sort of two of the really big issues were how do you deal with a commercial hood? If you're cooking for a, a larger group of people, and particularly if they are a vulnerable group of people, you want to make sure that you're not going to have a grease fire of some kind in the kitchen um, and that there are appropriate restraints and um, controls to to address that. And so um, we worked with them and actually were able to get a kitchen into the 2012 Life Safety Code, um, which the people who were part of the system did not believe was really possible. Um, so what you see in these images are the different ways in which we have uh, the codes now allow for hoods that don't look like those just completely huge stainless steel hoods that you see in restaurants and you saw in the first image, you can get them down to something that looks more residential. Um, and along with this were, were requirements for where the smoke compartment is and being able to separate enough space so that residents, if there's a fire in the kitchen, residents have another place to go to, to retreat to that is safe. Um, and we dealt with a number of other issues uh, in that addition as well. Addie's going to talk about one as well. Yeah. So one of the things that Maggie and I look at and want to emphasize here is this degree of fit between the operations and the environment, because we both recognize while, you know, in the absence of having a kitchen, you cannot cook. Having a kitchen doesn't necessarily mean that you can if you are not operationally supported to do so. So you really need those two components to be able to do something effectively that we all take for granted within our own homes every day, but occurs at least three times a day. Additionally, walking around our house, walking at all, it just doesn't happen as frequently in traditional long-term care settings. And this was another adjustment to NFPA that this group set out to make was providing seating in corridors for corridors that were perceived to be unmanageable in terms of their length for individuals who might have difficulty with ambulation. So there was a minimum of an eight foot width, which is not difficult to conform to because all of the buildings were built to that standard. And you could have groups of seating they had to, however, be attached to the wall and located only on one side of the corridor, allowing six foot clear in terms of distance. The groupings could not exceed 50 square feet. That wasn't necessarily a problem and have a minimum distance of 10 feet between them. And they couldn't obstruct any of the fire suppression equipment. But the fact that we were able to permanently locate seating within corridors to encourage ambulation and provide the, the physical means necessary to support person-centered care was, um, I think, a, a win. Yeah, that's really a functional issue. When the corridors are so long, a lot of older adults who are capable of walking don't walk that distance because they can't do it without stopping and resting. And if there's no furniture, they then end up being in a wheelchair and being pushed all the time which leads to faster physical decline. Um, so we look at those kinds of issues. Um, another example was one where we were working with um, ANSI and the accessibility codes uh, for 
the design of accessible bathrooms, which were based on the needs of people who are non-weight bearing and do a side slide transfer from their wheelchair over to the toilet. But that's not how the vast majority of older adults transfer. Next one. Um, I'm trying to speed up so we have time for discussion. Um, so we did some research. We had this toilet rig where we could adjust the height, the width, the depth of the grab bars, how close or how far away from the walls they were. Next slide. Um, this is just a sample of some of the data. Um, and what we did is we asked all of these residents of nursing homes, assisted living and independent communities, um, some were independent in transferring, some needed a one person assist, some needed a two person assist to be able to transfer. We asked them what their preferred dimension is and we measured them. There were, you can see the one that's in yellow, 60% of the people preferred to have the grab bars located between 13 and 14 inches away from the center line of the, of the toilet, which is not even what the ADA requirements are. So we ended up, next slide, coming up with some new recommendations. Um, and again, I won't go into all of the details. The, there's an article here that you can access. This has been incorporated in FGI guidelines um, and is, we are in the process over in the ICC world of also getting this and accessible and assisted showers um, incorporated into ANSI A117. From an FGI standpoint, we now had credible research that we could use to leverage from a residential setting perspective. The challenge is in a lot of locations, you're required to conform to ADA standards. So we had to insert the language, we're not required. You should be, should be using this kind of layout and provided a table for designers to be able to understand the way in which they could design um, bathrooms to support double-sided assist. Also, if there is a silver lining to be had through the pandemic, certainly recognizing the value of the household model is one of those. We are now advancing the household model within the guidelines as a recommendation, certainly eliminating barriers um, that would prevent an organization to designing. In the absence of being able to design a household model, what we're doing is we're trying to encourage operational approaches that provide the same kinds of movement that are present or not so present in household models. So restricting movement through spaces. Certainly taking a look at room designs to advance a maximum number of private bedrooms. In the last round of the guidelines, we took a hard look at the different types of kitchens in all of the residential health care and support settings, as well as dining rooms and acoustics in particular. One of the things that we looked at very carefully as a part of the Emergency Conditions Committee was this issue of isolation because it was its own pandemic. And looking at what evidence-based design we could leverage to facilitate visitation. And in this, we had some um, research that was generated by the Manitoba PCH initiative that had a design for visitation spaces that was largely based upon the physical proximity of individuals as well as the airflow through the HVAC and um, outside of the room. And then lastly, but certainly not least, person-centered care is not singularly about the residents living in communities. We also recognize that we need to be person-centered for staff as well. And one of the things that had previously been in the guidelines as a recommendation, we are now putting forth as a requirement in terms of giving staff the ability to have access to a shower. We recognize that even you know, in the course of daily business, you need the opportunity to, to shower should, you, should the event present itself and need present itself. So I think at this point, we want to uh, move quickly ahead and get to a point where we can talk with folks. Is that the sense, Addie and Maggie? Uh -huh. But I can sum summarize um, really quickly. Everything that we just talked about is about risk mitigation in the built environment. Do you want the building to do it for you? Do you want staff to hire a staff person to do it for you? 
And there are so many different types of uh, risks inside the built environment. Uh, we can sometimes make buildings more sa fire safe and in doing that, make them more infection prone. And sometimes we can mitigate an infection control kind of issue in the built environment and make it a lot less home-like. So we're always trying to balance those different drivers, those different risks and those different goals and perspectives. So at the end, um, what, what can you do? What can this group do to further some of these concepts that you like and you know, mitigate some of the concepts that you don't like? My first piece of advice is really try to, at a high level, understand the regulatory landscape. Understand that there are different codes that cover different types of risks. Understand, you know, as, as an owner, as a operator, understand who the authority having jurisdiction is. Know that person before you, you need them. Um, get to know that person before you're submitting an exemption request or bringing a design to them. Um, and really, when it, when it comes to codes and citation, always try to get your information from the source. Um, nobody can tell you to do something unless they have the authority to tell you to do something. So many times I get phone calls during the middle of the day where somebody tells me they have a compliance issue. And when I ask them who told them that, it's it wasn't an authority having jurisdiction or a survey or an inspector. It could be a salesperson. Always go back to the source. Always, ask for chapter and verse of the code that was cited and um, go back to that code. Don't go to chat GPT. If you want to, if you want to get a chuckle, ask chat GPT how, you know, what's the clearance between a bed and a wall? Um, it's, it's kind of funny. They're going to get better, but right now it's a, a little sketchy. And Maggie and I, you know, if you want to take a page out of our books, uh, if you don't like the rules, then join them and change them. And so, you know, that's that's one of the things that I think is is especially important about the code revision processes is there are certainly opportunities to join as a member, but there are opportunities to submit change proposals, to comment on proposals that have been submitted. It's as transparent a process as as can be afforded within the confines of, of a change of this magnitude, um, or provide information. You know, data is extremely helpful, and Maggie and I try to leverage this to the extent possible within um, the the confines of of building code development. Let's let's open it up for other questions. I know there have been some on chat, and I've been answering some of them. We, we got one, one going here from, from Melanie who asks about um, hospice care. And and first, I should say, thank you all very much. Uh, it's really informative. Um, but but from Melanie, um, just talking about, you know, does any of this work apply to hospice care? Um, if so, how? And, and particularly, um, Melanie is curious about a household model work. So within the 2022 edition, um, we really took a deep dive into hospice and I kind of spearheaded that task group, which had about 10 people sitting on it, some of whom were in the committee, some of whom were experts that we, subject matter experts that we brought in to consult with. And um, hospice was um, something we focused on not only in residential documents, but also in hospital as well. And it does absolutely, um, it, it's relevant to the household model. Hospice is a service that can be provided in healthcare settings, or it can be a healthcare setting that is specific for delivering that service. So we've actually made provisions to accommodate hospice care in those two ways. Um, in the 2022 document, I think is where we have the most robust changes and support for those purposes. Um do any other folks have questions? Uh, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, we have we have a word of gratitude in the chat. Um, and uh, if not, I'll, I'll ask one final question for, for you all. And you may have different answers, I suppose. But as you're working on this next edition uh, of the FGI for, for residential 
uh, facilities. Can can you talk about what what you feel like could be the the most powerful or high leverage change you're exploring, and and maybe some of those cost benefit factors you're weighing around it. I'll start because this is one of the topics that I was most focused on in trying to develop the language for, and it's around uh, increasing um, private rooms as opposed to shared rooms. And so we are proposing language that um, in new construction, 80% of all rooms, bedrooms need to be bedrooms, bedrooms, not apartments and assisted living, um, need to be private and that up to 20% of the residents or 10% of the rooms, it's the way the math goes, um, can be companion rooms. And we include language that says, the intent is that this is really for people who want to share a room together, siblings, spouses, friends. It's not meant for two strangers to be together. Um, and we have had uh, we've we've done some sort of testing of the waters and uh, put out a survey and most people said 80% seemed about right. And then we had one group that said, we disagree with this. We think 100% of the room should be private. And we had an equal number of people who said, we disagree. We think shared rooms are really good for a lot of people. And we don't think that you should be requiring private rooms. So there are people at all ends of that spectrum. And one of the areas that that spectrum encountered was in behavioral and mental health settings and, you know, caring for individuals in shared rooms, there really is the preference of a lot of the operators. So we, in recognition that we didn't have enough within the document that really covered that kind of setting, we've created a brand new chapter this go around in the 2026 guidelines that is specific to those kinds of settings. So we could differentiate from a environmental support and need based care provision um, between that population and others that would benefit from the private rooms. So um, yeah, go John. And for me, I think the thing, one of the biggest things that is in this current cycle is the things that you're not going to see um, show up in the book in the proposal period. We just got out of a three year long pandemic and I was afraid that we are going to see so many proposals to say every room is an isolation room. There's a hand wash sink around every single corner. Um, and that's, when you listen to the community, that's that's where people were leaning. Uh, there was a lot of fear and a lot of reaction. And I think we've taken a beat. We've we've looked at that. And I think the the data and the reason that comes out of that, we we aren't as seeing as many of those um, practical changes. And Ralph, I, you, you threw a comment in the chat. How do we address fear? I think we address fear through information, education, and good storytelling. And unfortunately, that just doesn't happen at the moment. Well, that, that's a, a beautiful place to conclude. I see some amazing questions in the chat. I, I may send them to our speakers to see if we can field a couple more responses on those and get them out uh, to the group along with the recording. Um, it's, thank you, John, Addie, and Maggie for being here and sh sharing this really important aspect of nursing home quality improvement with us. It's, it's, it's something we don't talk enough about in our nursing home quality work and something with a lot of clearly a ton of uh, powerful implications to it and, and ability to make real, real change across the country. So thank you so much for your work in nursing home quality improvement and for your time today. And thank you everybody else for being here and, and being part of this conversation with us. Um, we'll have another coalition conversation on March 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern to talk about the experience of family in nursing homes, a really important related topic, um, and all the things that all sorts of different families mean in nursing homes. So we hope to see you there. Um, wishing you all a lovely uh, afternoon um, and talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone.